Good morning. I'm Kristen Askelson, Managing Editor of the Acadiana Advocate, and welcome to the 2021 um, Acadiana Economic Outlook Summit. So today, along with business editor Adam Daigle, we will be your hosts for the summit. Um, and I'd like to thank, thank you all for joining us virtually today. I wish we could be having this in person, but you know, we all know why we can't. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, which we'll introduce in just a moment. Um, and I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Entergy, Acadian Ambulance, and Oshner Lafayette General for making this virtual event possible. There's a lot to unpack today. Um, coronavirus has uh, affected all sectors are, of our economy in one way or another. Um, and there, are, there have been some bright spots, including real estate and retail sales in Lafayette Parish, which we'll talk about. So to get us started, I'd like to introduce Gary Wagner, a professor of economics at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, who holds an endowed chair in economics. Um, Gary, if you would, please take a few minutes to give us your overview of the economic state of Acadiana. Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you and the team at The Advocate for inviting me to share my thoughts with you this morning. I also want to thank the sponsors for supporting the event and for everyone in the audience who've, who've taken time to join us this morning. You know, I'll describe my outlook for 2021 as, as cautiously optimistic. I think some of the recent data that I'll discuss in a moment indicates that growth in the first part of 2021 will likely be a little bit slower than what I anticipated a few months ago. However, with the rollout of the vaccine underway, I think all signs point to a much stronger recovery in the second half of this year. You know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics last week announced that the U.S. economy shed 140,000 jobs in December. This was the first month of job losses since April, and it does raise some concerns that the recovery has lost some steam. I mean, these losses nationally are likely tied to tightening restrictions associated with the resurgence of COVID cases that we saw around the country. In Louisiana, we really saw an uptick starting in early November. You know, compared to, say, the last recession, the 2008 recession, you know, one of the issues there is really how the, the economy handled financial risk, and there were some underlying issues in the economy. I think in this case, the economy is much, much stronger coming out of the recession than it was in 2008, which I think is a, is a very good sign. You know, the Lafayette region in particular uh, lost 24,000 jobs between February and March of 2020. That's a reduction of about 12%. So that's the largest drop in our region since the 1980s. You know, the good news is we gained about half of those jobs back in the next two months before our recovery started to moderate some. Uh, as of right now, we remain about 8,000 jobs below where we were in February of last year. But I think the good news is, barring any major COVID setbacks, I expect that we're going to gain all of these jobs back by the first quarter of 2022. One thing that's been a little bit different in this recession compared to past recessions is the pandemic recession has been very different in who has been impacted. So small businesses, low-income households, and women in particular are being hit very, very hard in this recession. To give an example, using data statewide for Louisiana, employment for individuals making $60,000 a year or more is only 1% below where it was when the recession started. So in other words, the recession is essentially over for this group of people. For individuals earning less than $27,000 per year, employment even today is still 20% below where it was before COVID. You know, using credit card transactions as an economic indicator, 30% of the small businesses in the state are either idle or doing significantly less business when compared to January of last year. As, of course, you might expect, the majority of these businesses or jobs are really centered in the leisure and hospitality sectors. So for certain sectors of the economy, we still have a really long way to go. And I think there are a lot of people around the state who are continue, who are, who are hurting. You know, as you mentioned, Kristen, the housing market's been a real bright spot for the region this year, and it continues to do so. I think that that's been fueled in part by a, a combination of historically low interest rates 
and low inventory levels. You know, inventory levels across Acadianus parishes are basically running roughly 40% below where they were at this time last year. You know, as, as a rule of thumb, every 5% drop in inventory is associated with a 1.5% increase in list prices. So given the inventory shortages that we're seeing around the region, list prices and sale price growth has been really robust. And in fact, in the Lafayette metro area, year-over-year uh, -year home price growth is only slightly trailing national home price growth, which uh, usually we're quite a bit below that pace. I think some additional evidence of, of why we should be optimistic for housing, you know, at the December meeting, the Federal Reserve signaled that they anticipate interest rates to remain low for at least the next two years. So that's a very positive sign for the housing market and for construction in general. I mean, I'm expecting the housing market to remain strong in 2021, and I would not be surprised to see an uptick in new residential construction in the region as well. One particular one potential downside in the housing market is I've estimated that about seven to eight percent of mortgages in Acadiana entered forbearance because of COVID. In Lafayette Parish, that figure represents about 5,600 homes and more than 10,000 people. The forbearance period can be as long as one year during which someone's mortgage payment is suspended or reduced. For most people, this expires either in January 2021 or February 2021. So mortgage holders have to make good on their mortgage after the forbearance ends. And based on national data, many people actually continue to pay their mortgages during forbearance. So I've been tracking mortgages in our region that are past due, actual defaults, and personal bankruptcy filings. And the good news is, to date, we are not seeing anything outside of the norm here. So I think this is something that we need to keep an eye on over the next few months as this evolves but I'm really optimistic at the moment based on all of the economic data that this is not going to turn out to be a drag on the region's economy. You know, I mentioned earlier that I'm expecting us to regain all of our job losses by early 2022. And the region has made some really great strides in diversifying our economy. Just to give you an example, you know, in 1990, the Lafayette region was one of the bottom three metro areas in the state for economic diversification. So we have nine uh, metropolitan statistical areas in Louisiana, which are essentially economic markets. Today, we're in the top three. Uh, it's important for really two reasons. Uh, first of all, a broader economic base makes us more resilient to recessions. And number two, it puts us in a better position to be innovative and cr to create economic opportunities. The health and education sector is now the largest in the region in terms of overall wages, accounting for almost 20% of the region's earnings. I'm looking for the health and construction sectors really to be the, the job leaders this year. I think there are a number of noteworthy investments that have occurred or will occur in the region that I think the other panelists are likely to discuss. So I wanna hit on one lesser known fact about our region that I think is important is the Lafayette MSA is the most innovative region in the state by a very wide margin if one uses patents as the benchmark for innovation. So in addition to being a more diversified economy, there's also a blossoming innovation hub here that's really focused around tech in general, biotech and biomed in particular. And I think to the extent that we can encourage even more entrepreneurial activity in our region, to kind of parallel our existing economic firms, we're gonna be even better positioned over the long term to see growth in the region. And that's all I have for you at the moment, Kristen. Thanks, Gary. That um, uh, there, are some, there are some bright spots in there. That's a, a very different message from six months ago, um, much more, um, much more uplifting. It was not a very happy message about six months ago. So as I said, um, our business editor, Adam Daigle, <clears throat> is going to um, is going to be the co-host today. He's going to take over from here and um, introduce our panelists who um, will each speak a minute or two about um, what they're seeing from their perspectives on the Acadiana economy. And then we'll do a Q&A and um, Adam and I will sort of jump in with some questions and I'm sure we'll be talking about some of those things you mentioned, Gary. So Adam, you wanna take over from here? 
Adam, you're muted. <laughs> the... All right, I'm in. Sorry. All right. Hey, thanks for the handoff. Um, it's good to hear um, a lot of the data Gary said, Gary recited. It was, um, you know, we did this thing six months ago and it was just such a downer. Um, the time we were in and, and the top of discussion. So um, things are kind of are, are moving back in the right direction. So that's very good. I want to introduce our panelists. Um, first is Mr. Patrick Gandy. He's the Chief Operating Officer with Oshner Lafayette General. He's the Chief Executive Officer and for the, for the Medical Center. He serves as Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer and has responsibility for the LGMC. Mr. Gandy has held multiple other senior manager positions throughout the system, including Vice President of Managed Care and Administrator of Lafayette General Surgical Hospital and Lafayette General Imaging. He is a member of the American Health College of Healthcare Executives and the Healthcare Financial Management Association. He is a graduate of LGUS and uh, University of Louisiana at Lafayette and is also a CPA. Next, we have uh, Ms. Anita Begno, the CEO of the Downtown Development Authority and Downtown Lafayette Unlimited. She leads the organization that facilitates physical, economic, cultural, and cultural development of Lafayette's downtown district, as well as a nonprofit organization tasked with telling downtown Lafayette's story and marketing it as, it as a vibrant and unique place to live, work, and play. She pursues preservation and enhancement of its important place as the heart of Lafayette and Acadiana by working directly with city parish government, business leadership, and developers to advocate for progress and market the region's core. Next is Mr. Chad Orty. He is a partner and associate broker with Scout Real Estate. Launched in, with partners in 2018, Scout is the only locally owned firm solely on commercial real estate in Acadiana. Born and raised along the bayous and sugar cane fields of South Louisiana, Chad grew up designing and building things and was taught at an early age the value of hard work and persistence. He began working in commercial real estate in college and became an independent broker five years later. He's known as a trusted source of knowledge and opportunity with an uncanny ability to connect with any level. And he maintains close and effective relationships with a diverse group of people. Next is Mr. Troy Wayman. He has been president and CEO of the 800 member One Acadiana since 2018. He is the vice, former vice president of the economic development for the Mobile Area Chamber, Chamber of Commerce in Alabama which is a 2000 member organization where he served for nine years. He earned his undergraduate degree at Faulkner University and was credentialed as a certified economic developer by the American Economic Development Council. And next is Mr. Corey Jack of Jack and Associates, a consulting firm of entrepreneurs. Corey is the executive director of the Holy Rosary uh, Institute Redevelopment Project. He also serves as a manager for, for Lafayette Chamber Affairs for 180 Indiana. He has been a participant in Leadership Lafayette. He has founded Youth Literacy Foundation for Indiana and serves as its executive director. He has a degree from the University of Louisiana Lafayette and an MBA from the University of Phoenix. That is our panel for this morning, gentlemen and ladies. Hope you're all doing well. Like I said, the last time we did this, it was um, it was a kind of a downer. But as we move forward, things are getting better. Our numbers are trending in the right direction, and let's 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 dive in. Let's talk about it. Uh, let's go first off. Uh, and I'll give a question for you, Anita. You know, we talked. We we read about it and talked about a lot the the, um, the tough years been for restaurants in Lafayette and especially, you know, the downtown where there's a hub of rest popular restaurants. What's the year been like for them and, and how they, they've been kind of persevered because um, I'm not sure any of them closed as we all were afraid was going to happen. Right. It was an interesting year for restaurants uh, and bars for sure. And a number of our bars downtown have transitioned into using conditional restaurant 
permits for the time being and starting to sell food so that they can be open to customers. So, you know, it's been really different from restaurant to restaurant. Um, everyone really put their heads down and focused on pivoting to online sales and to go orders. Uh, you know, we saw a lot of growth in waiter in the last uh, year and uh, downtown restaurant was uh, downtown Lafayette restaurants were certainly a part of that growth and in our market, you know, it's all about innovation and it's all about um, reaching out to your customer base and encouraging that small business support when it comes to restaurants, people who had food that worked really well for that uh, saw some growth in some areas, certainly in their to go orders. Um, but, you know, the folks who had outdoor seating had a different advantage over those who did not. Mm -hmm. um, but we have seen things kind of level off and some steadying uh, with our restaurants in downtown. We certainly appreciate all of the support from the community that you've given over the last year to them, whether you placed a toot and scoot order or you ordered through waiter or uh, you came in and, and sat in the restaurants when we could. Um, it's it's something that we are cautiously optimistic about, as Gary mentioned earlier. I think that's the new term taking the place of unprecedented times uh, from 2020. Um, but you see folks interested in opening restaurants in downtown Lafayette right now. So um, I am looking forward to continuing the support of these small businesses in our district. Um, as people return to the office, there's an impact as well on our restaurants because so many people working down here provides day to day, Monday through Friday support for them. You know, things like the courthouse, people who uh, occupy the Chase Tower. Um, you see direct support it, to those restaurants when those folks are downtown and their feet are on the sidewalks and they're looking to get out of their office to get a bite to eat. So um, I'm looking forward to working with our restaurants this year. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a number of restaurants who are interested in looking at downtown, obviously, you know, taking it slow at the moment. But um, I'm feeling good about um, our community rallying around our restaurants. And I truly think that's what's kept them afloat during a really tough year, um, as well as their ability to uh, to pivot. All right. Next um, for Chad, um, you know, we, last time we were here, we talked about um, possibility of lots of commercial vacancies in Lafayette. A lot of reports na nationwide saying that's happening. But, you know, I follow the um, the real estate transactions pretty, pretty vigorously every day. And, and properties are still being bought and sold. Give me, give me an idea of what's happening out there. And um, is, is this is rise of vacancies? Are you seeing that happening here or no? Not a tremendous amount. Uh, I mean, there are different sectors to talk about. Uh, you know, the industrial side of things in, in Latin and Acadia was having, uh, I guess, a, a, a shift, if you will, or something to look at before, you know, the pandemic. And, um, I, you know, there are some, some inventory in that world, some machine shops and stuff that, um, you know, you'd see that are some vacancies. But, uh, you know, office, yes, of course, the pandemic has affected the general, you know, just people being in the office. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think there's a major shift in that whole culture of working. I think that people are going to come back to the office. They are already. Um, I think it's important for companies to have accountability, to have routines and then teamwork and synergy. So, you know, I think that there's, I mean, there's been a lot of activity actually in the leasing in the office world. Um, I think the retail side is a little bit something for us to kind of reflect on and follow a little bit more. Amazon with what they're doing uh, is incredible. Uh, I think we'll see some bigger bigger announcements being made in the short term. And you're talking about millions and millions of square feet of space just being mm -hmm. put on in a very short term. Uh, and what's filling that space and what space is it coming out of, right? You know, um, it's not new inventory. It's inventory being shifted around from yep. one block of space to the other. And so I think that's going to be really interesting. I think it's going to happen very fast. I think the pandemic is backtracking it. I think that uh, it was already happening before. So, but all in all, I think, you know, I mean, the residential world is something we follow because there's, there's, that gives us a good indication of, uh, you know, some things that are happening. And I think it's important, you know, um, to, to note, yes, the uh, inventory is down, prices are up, but you know, demand is there too, and and demand was there previous to COVID and the low interest rates. It was we yeah. got the KDN was still setting records um, mm -hmm. for all that. So, all in all, you know, I mean, w you know, we have a lot of space here. A lot of it's affordable too. I think it's great affordable real estate here, and uh, behind all that is the workforce that that can 
literally build anything here. So, uh, and I'm learning more and more about the medical and great to hear the innovation side that, that was mentioned earlier in the patent. So um, there's a lot of fun, exciting things that are constantly happening here. So. Next, Gary, I'll give you my next question. You and you mentioned a little bit in your in your uh, your intro about um, the number of job losses that have fallen on women. I think there was a big headline this past week that women made almost um, all the job losses nationwide. Can, can you kind of tell me, just talk a little bit more about that? Why is that happening, and and what um, is it more? Maybe some uh, parents uh, pulling out uh, to stay home with kids during this quarantine time, or what effect does that have? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. I mean, the number that I reported earlier nationwide, we had 140,000 job losses. They were all women. It wasn't mostly women, so it was 100% women. Uh, and I think what we're seeing in the in the pandemic is with people staying at home, the women are bearing the larger burden of, of childcare. And so they're exiting the labor force more so than men. And I think they're being disproportionately affected in terms of job losses more than men. And, and it differs from recession to recession. So if you go back to 2008, one of the things that happened in that recession nationwide is it had a disproportionate impact on men. And so people called that the man session. And so one of the things that we're just seeing here because of the nature of, of how this has changed work and family life is it's having a disproportionate impact on women. Oh. Corey, my next question for you. Um, we talked about a little bit about this earlier this year as you work with small businesses and they've had to um, kind of get creative during this time and shift and, and get away from the, the in-person business and that sort of thing. Um, tell me some stories about how some of the people you work with have had to do this and kind of just um, really kind of get innovative to, to survive. Well, sure. So, you know, it's definitely been a challenging year last year for several small business owners. And it's my experience of working with them. Um, it's almost as though they fall into three different categories. The first are those small businesses who COVID has definitely negatively impacted. Um, and they are just trying to hold on. They're just trying to weather the storm uh, and, and get through to it and uh, didn't change up their operations a whole lot. And those were the ones mostly seeking uh, a lot of the SBA uh, relief funding, the PPP economic injury disaster loan and things like that. And then there's a sort of second category of small business owners really actively trying to pivot their operations, whether that's their day to day operations, how they do things, restaurants starting to offer different um, um, offerings or retailers trying to offer different products. A lot of um, a lot of retailers who did not have an online presence having to transition into e commerce. And then there's this third category um of entrepreneurs looking to start businesses either because they um identified um, some opportunity in the market that COVID, the pandemic brought about or they were let go from their job um, because of the impact of COVID. so they're basically trying to start a job as a way to bring start a business uh, just to generate some type of supplemental income for their household so um, we see the impact small business in a variety of ways um, I've seen people get really, really creative. Um, as mentioned, there's retailers who've had to uh, hurry up and expedite the process of developing an online store. And, you know, you see one Acadiana had several webinars with partners um, teaching them how to do so. LSBDC had a series of, uh, of webinars, DDA, um, just started helping to streamline that process. So that's one way they really had to get innovative, which is a good idea to have an online presence anyway, because you can tap into a different, uh, you know, a larger market of customers that you might not have had even before the pandemic. So um, you've seen people do that. Um, and it depends on industry. I've worked with one uh, woman owned minority woman owned janitorial service who prior to the pandemic, she was actually growing. Her business was growing, um, not just on the residential side, but her commercial clients were growing. And then the pandemic hit. Um, so what she did was she started offering a new service um, to where she in, she um, invested in an electrostatic machine that um, you know that that was good with um, helping to remove viruses and things like that from the uh, from the workplace. So she started getting more commercial clients just because she was willing to be a little bit more innovative. The advocate did an article on her, so she got more clients from there. When Acadiana featured um, her on. Um, their small and minority business profile. And both of those, both, uh, that exposure gave for more clients as well. 
So that was that's another example of how um, we've seen people pivot um, in their particular businesses to just to sort of survive during COVID and also explore new ways to obtain new clients even and tap into new opportunities. Very interesting. I, those always make good stories. Um, my, I guess, Troy, my next question is for you. You know, we've written a, a good bit about um, the one Acadian of 55 by 25 initiative. Um, it's, it's very ambitious and it's, uh, it's very, it's fascinating uh, concept. Um, kind of an interesting time as, as people might be losing jobs going back to school. Give me an update on that and uh, how has that been, uh, been going so far? Oh, you're muted. Had it poised, ready to hit the unmute button, and forgot to do it. So, apologize. Um, yeah, I appreciate that question. You know, our 55 by 25 initiative is one of our, our big initiatives in, in education because one of the things that companies look at when, when we're trying to recruit a company into our area is the the level of educational attainment, advanced educational attainment. So, if you look at the working age adults across the region, we're currently uh, with, that have a two-year or four-year degree or a high-value certification that gets them a, a good job. We're at about 38% uh, of the population across Acadiana. And uh, if we did nothing right now on the current track that we're on, we would hit about 42% by 2025. So we've set a stretch goal of getting that to 55%. Well, that's going to take partnership with uh, all of our uh, higher education institutions across the region. Uh, LSUE, FSCC, of course, UL, strong partner of ours. And um, uh, in getting a lot of these people back to school, this has been a great opportunity for them because they're having to retool their skill sets. And so we're seeing an increase in those people that are, as we're calling them, comebackers, uh, people that have, uh, that have some college education but haven't completed a degree. So we want to get them back in, enrolled, um, and, uh, and, and get them to complete that degree, or complete that certification so that they can get a, a job. You know, Gary mentioned the, the, the fact that we uh, we've really grown in our diversification efforts across the region. And I think that's something that's really strong. Uh, we obviously recognize the oil and gas sector is something that's uh, critically important to this community and critically important to this region. But we also have to pay attention that that is a cyclical industry, obviously, as we've seen. I mean, this year alone, we're looking at a, about a 26 percent decrease in, in oil prices from this time last year. And, and uh, that's devastating to a lot of these companies. So if we're going to survive those ebbs and flows of that industry, we have to diversify and come up with other places for people to work. So uh, we, we work on that a, a great deal. And that's one of the pieces that this educational component plays a huge role in is retooling that talent. Um, uh, this year has been great for us and some of that diversification. We've, we've had, with our partners across the region, we've had five project announcements that total about $110 million in capital investments. And that's across three different parishes of our of our region. Um, now the job numbers were right at the new job numbers were right at 302 jobs, which we'd like that job number to be higher. But people, a lot of industries took this opportunity to do some uh, updating and, and some uh, uh, just investing the money in their in their uh, companies to get them prepared for the future. And uh, anytime a company invests that kind of capital into their facilities, a lot less chance they're going to leave. So it's an opportunity for us to. Um, not only create some new jobs, but also uh, solidify the presence of the existing jobs and retain those jobs. So we're excited about that. Good, sure, thank you. Patrick, my next question is for you, sir. What's, um, you know, we've written a lot about um, the, the, the effect that COVID has had on the uh, staff at the hospitals, um, very stressed out, very overworked. What's, what's the, um, the fallout from, for the healthcare facilities for treating patients and how has it kind of cost the, uh, the what's it cost for, for, for professionals and kind of keeping their head above water? Yeah, yeah. Great, uh, great question. So uh, it has been a, a very challenging uh, nine months for uh, for all healthcare providers and uh, healthcare providers in, in Lafayette as well and, and across, uh, across the nation. Uh, you know, taking care of, you know, at uh, Ostner Lafayette General Medical Center, you know, we uh, we have uh, probably 50, 60 uh, COVID patients that we're taking care of today. That number has been as high as 110. Uh, and so the challenges that that creates in our ability to be able to take care of our community 
is, uh, is, is significant in the impact it has on our emergency department uh, and our, our bed capacity, but most importantly, uh, the impact that it has on our, our healthcare workers, our frontline healthcare workers, it is, it is, uh, it, it's, it's tough work. And, you know, we've done everything that we can uh, to, uh, to support them uh, through this and uh, making sure that they're protected and safe. Uh, I, I will say that, you know, where we are now, uh, we've talked about everyone being cautiously optimistic on the, uh, the economy. There is a real uh, sense of uh, optimism in the in the healthcare community now uh, with the vaccine rollout. And you know, as we've uh, developed a strike teams to uh, deploy the vaccine across all of the markets and communities that we serve, uh, you know, that's a real sense of optimism for our employees because they can see on the other side of this uh, that this is this is how we can really. Uh, impact the pandemic and start to decrease the numbers uh, in our healthcare facilities and really impact the health status of, of our communities. And so that optimism uh, is so exciting to see amongst our employees. Uh, but also right now, as we're uh, focused on the 70 and above population throughout Acadiana, uh, the sense of optimism within that group and how appreciative they are uh, as they come out, they receive their vaccine and the stories that we've heard and, and how many of those individuals have been, you know, in their homes for, for nine months now and they've not seen family. Uh, so being able to receive the vaccine, be able to get out, interact with their, their families and, and the community, uh, that is, is, is super exciting and uh, we're, we're glad to, to lead the way as far as deploying vaccine throughout Acadiana. Adam, I think you might be on mute. Yeah. All right, there we go. All right, thanks. Uh, Anita, I'll go back to you for our next question. You know, we've written about um, uh, residential construction downtown. We've got, we've got the Vermillion Lofts up, we've got the Buchanan uh, townhomes up. Um, work is gonna start back on the courthouse. Uh, what? What's, it, what's this year going to look like for residential construction? Do we see uh, another little wave of it? Or um, do you think that maybe some developers might take a wait and see approach? Uh, what do you see happening? Yeah, we definitely see some growth in the residential market in 2021. The old federal courthouse, as you mentioned, is shifting to the construction phase and they have a target deadline of December 31st of this year to complete that project. That'll add nearly 70 units, um, market rate units to the downtown mix, which, which is a huge footprint. Um, also, LPTFA continues their work on their, their Monroe project, which has 70 units, um, downtown development authority district adjacent across um, second and third streets. Um, that's 70 units. So you're looking at nearly 150 just with those two. We also know that Stephen Ortigo is working on a second phase of his project. You mentioned Vermilion Loss, which was his first phase. That was 24 units and 3,500 square feet of commercial. And he's looking at a larger scale development. Uh, directly across the street on Vermilion, uh, right off of Johnston Street. That'll have somewhere between 35 to 50 units, uh, perhaps some condos mixed into that. And it'll also have uh, eight to 10,000 more square feet of commercial that'll be added to the mix, which is so close to the Don's location. And the redevelopment that we hope to see there, I think will add to what Stephen is working to do and vice versa. And so, you know, I know we'll probably dive into this more, but I think what you're gonna see beyond what I've talked about really depends upon the continued retail growth that we saw in 2020, as well as people making office decisions and whether or not they see downtown Lafayette as a place to make a choice to intentionally office, because those amenities really work together to support that residential growth and vice versa. All right, thanks, Chad. I'll give the next one to you. Um, we haven't talked about the Amazon project yet, so here's our chance. Um, you're a commercial realtor. Uh, what does what does that do when you drop in a huge facility like that with 500 jobs and the population growth? I'm assuming that'll happen with it. What um, what does the, the kind of the year look like for? Well, I guess this year because it won't be built till the end of the year. What's the future hope for kind of around that area and kind of the Karen Crow area?
And I'm here. There we go. Sorry. Uh, appreciate the question. You know, I think it's still unknown a little bit because it's moving so fast to, to do, you know, they're doing this all over the country. So it's, it's, it's a massive shift, uh, you know, and it's interesting to hear that, you know, I think a lot of people thought it was going to be a facility that was delivering groceries right away, but uh, it's, it's turned out to be a, a little bit of a different um, focus. So hopefully they realize that uh, people in Louisiana and Lafayette can, can build all those products for them and, and ship them out of that, that location. So um, I think it'll drive some, some growth in upper Lafayette. You know, they, they already had a good momentum going up there. Uh, a lot of new rooftops and some new retail. And, uh, you know, it, I think it will drive uh, some growth up there for sure. But to, to know what exactly how the effect of the inventory, I mean, I know there are some moves, some, some local companies that do business with Amazon uh, that are making some moves right now to, to get more space and to be better positioned for, um, to, to grow themselves. So you will see that, um, but it's, it's a big unknown because it's happening so fast and, and um, it's, it's a very, you know, large amount of space being shifted around. So, uh, but super excited to hear that we have that and Baton Rouge got one. I think there'll be some more announcements soon too, so. Yeah, thanks, it's, it's exciting that, that, that uh, that section of, of Lafayette Parish, I was talking to the realtor yesterday, he said, watch, that's the market that's really starting to emerge, so. Uh, Gary, my next question is to you. You mentioned you've got some comparisons with um, the housing bubble uh, from earlier, uh, some 10 so years ago. What is the difference and what's kind of, um, are there any parallels that happen there or what's kind of separating us from that time uh, from 2008? I think that's a great question. In 2008, what we were really seeing around the country were households were taking on a lot of additional debt to buy houses, especially in three, four, five. So households were leveraging and, it, and kind of going into the 2008 recession. This is true nationally. It was true in Louisiana. So debt to income ratios were about their, at their historic peak going back to 1980. So households had a lot of debt at that time. One thing that's different now is household debt to income ratios are near their all time lows. So in other words, what's fueling this housing market is likely a lot more sustainable because it's not being fueled by debt. You know, I think one, one of the things that we're seeing, I found some uh, apartment listing data that I looked at recently. And I think what's happening is we're seeing a transition. We don't have a huge influx of new people into the region. So they're not new people moving in who are buying these homes. I think we're probably seeing people purchasing investment properties as one piece, but I also think we're seeing a lot of people who were renting apartments transitioning into home ownership. And in fact, when you look at the apartment listings data, uh, the listing prices are down year over year, which would be consistent with that. So I think, in other words, to kind of sum it up, I think what we're seeing in the housing market locally is likely a lot more sustainable than what we saw in 2008. I don't have any concerns that we're experiencing a housing bubble. And that's one of the reasons why I think, given that demand is up, given that the interest rate environment is gonna be very favorable in the coming years, I see housing continuing to kind of pull us along over the short term. Thanks. Uh, Troy, the next question is for you. Um, I'm not sure we've written about enough about it. But, um, one of Katie is, uh, Katie Anna's effort for bridging the digital divide, getting schools kind of connected there this time. What's that effort been like and how how uh, how collaborative, I guess, is, have, has the business community been in that effort to, to get schools and, and families connected? That's a great question. It's a great program. We're really, really, really excited about it. It's, um, you know, one of the things that COVID exposed uh, this past year exposed even further exposed we knew there was an issue but uh is the the fact that we have a number of homes that don't have access to broadband internet and that is uh just makes it difficult for number one parents to work from home uh but also the students obviously from doing school work from home so um in recognition of that uh, dr schumacher's foundation uh and love our school came up with a program called love our schools link and learn and we've worked collaboratively with them uh, along with Cox and at and and the public school system, LCG, LUS have, have all been involved, uh, as well as a number of other foundations across the region. Uh, and that is to uh, provide low cost or no cost uh, broadband access to these homes that are that may have a financial burden that they can't 
uh, making it impossible for them to get that access. Um, the school system also came up with some ideas where we, we outfitted about 45 buses, school buses with Wi-Fi hotspots where they could locate in different areas so students can gather and, and do schoolwork uh, and have access to those hotspots. Uh, all of the public school, Lafayette Public School System's parking lot, school parking lots are Wi-Fi hotspots now. Um, and so uh, we're, we're very excited about uh, this happening. Uh, and this that leads to another uh, program that's part of this called Project Moonshot, which we're hoping will will really take off, and we expect it to. But it's basically being able to have a a, wesh, a mesh Wi-Fi network that covers an extended area. Uh, particularly, we're going to start with the 70501 zip code, which has the highest number of people who are who have limited to to no uh, broadband access. And um, uh, LCG has been great giving us access to poles and and uh, um, some right of ways and that sort of thing. But uh, this will be a, a mesh Wi-Fi network that will provide access to the school Wi-Fi system to that entire area. This works as we think it will. It'll be something that we can package and uh, uh, expand to the entire parish and then package it and take it to our outlying parishes that have even bigger challenges uh, in some of the rural areas uh, for broadband access. So, um, you know, we know now more than ever access to good Wi-Fi or good broadband is uh, critical to our future and the future of our workforce. So uh, we've got to we've got to work hard to make that happen. So we've had uh, great participation from a number of businesses and, and as I mentioned, uh, foundations in the area. Uh, we're fortunate to have those folks and have them be proactive and be willing to help in situations like this. Very interesting. That's that's the uh, connectivity is something we've heard about a lot, especially outside Lafayette Parish. It's a real issue. So it sounds great that you all are addressing that. Uh, Corey, my next question is for you. We're, we can talk um, PPP money. Another round of that is coming. Um, tell me about the uh, just the people you work with. Um, what, what did that? How did that help those folks at first round? Did everyone get the the, the money they needed? And um, how are things moving forward, some of those folks? Um, it was definitely rough at first. Um, whenever the uh, you know, whenever the legislation rolled out, um, just the federal guidelines it just rolled out so quickly, and there was a lot of ambiguity. A lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of clarity there, um, and a lot of the small businesses that were trying to access those PPP funds had to go through a couple of challenges. First of all, the a lot of CTAs and accountants were a little hesitant at first with the lack of guidelines because of um, liability reasons, understandably so. Um, and also some banks, you know, not every bank embraced it right away. So those are those are some of the challenges that all small businesses had to face. Um, also a lot of very small or micro businesses, they're like one or two man shows. So they are their finance, their, their own like finance person the department. So that's a lot of stuff that they had to gather on their own because they didn't have a, a comptroller or, um, or a CFO. So those are some of the, those are some of the early challenges. Um, things got better as more clarification got, uh, came out and as more CPAs got wind up and it started assisting. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of issues that I've seen, particularly, was with um, minority-owned businesses. Um, not many of them were able to receive the funds that they asked for. Um, I was reading some information. I think about twelve percent of uh, minority-owned businesses actually got what they asked for, which I think highlight a bigger issue that I, I think that we can all lend some more effort and attention to. Um, I was reading an article um, a couple of days ago that from uh, Forbes, which I think really captures what I've seen locally. Um, it said that the recent data underscores the historically tenuous relationships that minority business owners have with many major banks, making it, uh, make it increasingly difficult for minorities to navigate the obstacles necessary to secure a federal loan successfully. That is something I've seen at the local level um, heavily. Um, so um, I, we've had um, we have, we've had great programs and resources to kind of help um, spread the word, but I think there's still some more work that needs to be done um, in that regard. Um, but just kind of zooming back out and talking about small businesses in, in general, um, you know, Lafayette has a pretty strong small business resource ecosystem. So I think those partners really came together um, to spread the word about PPP. Um, the SBA, L LSBDC was just the, uh, an incredible source of information. 
um, you know, given their connection with SBA. So they were really able to spread the word. They were able to answer questions. I know Lita partnered with LCG and they created a hub there. One of Kitty and, a, uh, and partners convened um, a series of webinars um, to spread that information. So um, I'm really proud of how, um, you know, our, uh, our local ecosystem really came together to spread the information as soon as more clarification came out, it seemed like there was some webinar there to spread that information. So um, I think that we'll be uh, um, better prepared this time around with the, with the second round of, of funding coming out. Hey, I have a question um, about something that Gary mentioned earlier when he, he talked about innovation and the number of patents we see here, which I think is so cool and such a bright spot in Acadiana. So I'm wondering if any of you want to weigh in on that, you know, besides um, small businesses and restaurants that are innovating, to, you know, to respond to COVID, um, we have had some tech companies move in. Um, you know, there's always been this talk about um, creating this silicon bayou. So um, do any of you want to want to talk about what you're seeing and whether we might be be really on the verge of that? Kristen, I, I'll, I'll jump in from a downtown perspective. I think it provides a lot of opportunity for that residential growth that Adam asked about earlier. You know, I've I've been looking at some workplace studies, some office studies um, to try to see what the trends are looking like at a national level and. Cushman and Wakefield actually just put out a really good report about the ecosystem of the workplace. And I think there's a tie between people returning to the workplace and having innovation and opportunities to collaborate. And that's where good ideas really come from. You know, the opportunity machine moving downtown, I think will have a huge impact on continuing to foster that innovative growth, as well as CGI making the decision to locate in downtown Lafayette and being able to see what the the follow on effects of something like that will do for innovation in our area, as well as looking to the future to see, you know, everyone's watching to see what Schoolman's going to do for a permanent location. Uh, we are hopeful that they will choose downtown Lafayette because we feel like it'll be a place that will foster the creativity that they're looking for in hiring talent, potentially recruiting talent from the outside, relocating from other markets where there's areas of expertise. We saw them purchase a company uh, in New Orleans. And so if they want to move any of those folks over, ideally, we'd love to see them locate in the downtown area where that innovative culture, that heart of Acadiana and Lafayette uh, can really thrive. Um, you know, and going back to office space and what the future really does look like, um, Cushman and Wakefield did some focus groups on that very topic. They talked to investors and occupiers as well as placemakers. And I think the biggest opportunity for us is that people are going to want to be intentional about office space for employees and for colleagues that can come together to um, bring together that creativity, but also job satisfaction. You know, we've learned that we can work from home. Productivity was up for a long time, but should we? You know, I think especially when it comes to the cultural uh, impacts of a corporate society in the tech industry, in that innovative industry, a huge part of talent's decision on where they want to work and where they want to open that innovative business, where they want to stretch their legs and try something new um, has to do with the location where they work. Um, we know that tech companies can work from home, but should they? Uh, so I think all these things kind of tie together. And I do see um, as Mayor President, former Mayor President Joel Robito did downtown Lafayette as an innovation hub. And so I think the growth of downtown and the growth of innovation are going to be paralleled and we could do well to focus on making sure that both are happening together. And I will just add from Oshner uh, Lafayette General's perspective, there are a number of uh, new uh, exciting uh, companies in, in Lafayette uh, that we're looking to, to support in the, the tech and biotech uh, space. Uh, Tides Medical is, is uh, you know, making great strides here in, in the biotech uh, area. Uh, Hamper, Presto, uh, exciting new uh, company in, uh, in drug delivery, uh, which we feel is going to be a, a big, big market it, going hand in hand with telemedicine. Somebody has a telemedicine visit, they need a prescription, and uh, Presto fills that uh, 
uh, that space by making uh, delivery available in those types of situations. So, you know, two, I think, great examples of local companies that we're very excited about and working with them in an innovative fashion and trialing their business model within our uh, our patient population uh, that uh, we we feel are uh, are on a on a great path and you know there are there are numerous others but we're we're consistently looking for those types of uh, companies that we can partner with and help foster their their business model. I I uh, to kind of jump on Patrick's bandwagon and, and he beat me to it. I was muted again and I started talking and he was. He, he, he beat me to, he was already unmuted, uh, but he's exactly right. One of the things, the discussions that we've had internally for a while now, and, and we're going to be taking some action uh, to um, uh, to leverage these resources. If you look at the uh, healthcare resources that we have and uh, in, in healthcare innovation resources that we have in our region, really for a region our size, it's really phenomenal. Um, I mean, really, really phenomenal. And with the commitment that Auctioner Lafayette General has in, in, in our region, and then you look at some of the homegrown companies that we have, like LHC, Viamed, Schumacher Clinical Partners. I mean, it, it, it's really phenomenal the infrastructure that we have in that area, and being able to leverage that brain power to grow more innovation in that area, and um, and create more jobs in that area. Um, I, mean, I, I think we're on the precipice of some really, really great things. That is really good to hear. Um, so we started out today with um, with Gary giving us sort of, um, you know, the economist outlook for 2021. Um, before we finish, I'd, I'd like to give you all um, a minute or two to talk about, you know, we have a new administration coming in. We have a COVID vaccine rolling out. Um, we have people working from home who may be heading back to the workplace. So if each of you could take a minute or two to kind of wrap up and talk about what you're um, predicting for 2021 in your sector. Um, Patrick, you want to start? Sure, I, I'd be happy to. Uh, so uh, from healthcare's perspective, uh, we, we are, uh, we're excited about 2021 because it would really be hard to, to be uh, worse than, than 2020 from uh, a, a, a business standpoint with two hurricanes and, and a pandemic and the impact that that's had on our ability to be able to take care of our patients has been uh, really unbelievable. So as we look at the coming year uh, with optimism with the vaccine and how uh, we really start to get this pandemic under control and then uh, freeing up healthcare resources for those who, who not that our COVID patients don't need those uh, healthcare uh, resources, but you know, we really have been in a situation where we've been unable to take care of some trauma patients and patients that have come in requiring our services, but we've just been uh, full. All of our, our, our resources have been uh, in use. So being able to really keep all those patients here locally, that is our, our goal. And we're excited about that uh, in the coming year. And with the new uh, administration, uh, you know, the I think the reality is with the, 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 the Biden administration, uh, their perspectives on health care and health care funding are going to be significantly different than uh, than the Trump administration. Uh, so from healthcare standpoint, uh, as we look at those uh, additional uh, potential resources and the investments that, that we'll then be able to make into uh, our services here locally, uh, we think uh, uh, we're, we're, we're really excited about that. And then, uh, you know, we'll be deploying $94 million worth of uh, investments from Oshner in building new patient towers, uh, in expanding resources, not only at Oxnard Lafayette General Medical Center, but across uh, our entire health system in South Central and Southwest Louisiana. And that is going to create additional capacity and create additional healthcare jobs. So we're, we're excited about all of that. And those projects will be done within the next 18 months. Uh, so that will have a, a significant impact in the short term on Acadiana. Y'all are going to be busy. Yeah. So uh, in true Brady Bunch fashion, you want to go next, Anita? 
Sure. I think there's really five areas that you can watch downtown Lafayette for. We talked about office space. I want to look back really quickly on some of the office leasing transactions that occurred in 2020 that give me a lot of optimism. CGI choosing to locate in the Versailles Center and working on that remodel. Uh, Key Miller relocated its Lafayette office into downtown in the Chase Tower, along with a dozen other new businesses that located in the Chase Tower. Zonbreaker Designs, which was formerly located in the Gordon Square building, moved into a more prominent space on Jefferson Street, growing their office operations. Uh, I spoke to uh, the, the folks in charge of the DiMaggio, Roy and Edwards Tower downtown, and they held steady in 2020. Uh, they only have one suite currently available. So looking at filling our vacant office space and the opportunities uh, that people are going to be looking for for office space, I think there's a great spot for downtown in that. We talked about residential growth. Uh, I'm really excited to see these units come online and to provide diversity of opportunity of places for people to live and types of um, places for them to live in the CBD uh, of downtown Lafayette, um, I think is going to be very telling about the future. And I think investors are watching to see what happens with those particular developments to see uh, where their heads are going to be in the next number of years about uh, joining that development uh, growth. Uh, restaurants, bars and cafes, like I said, it's all about innovation. It's about outdoor seating. It's about having a robust to go and online presence um, and offering something different um, that you can't get anywhere else in downtown Lafayette. Um, retail focus is going to be huge. We didn't really talk about that, but I know in the Advocates 2020 uh, recap of the, the five biggest business stories, our diversification of retail was certainly one of them. We saw double digits of openings in 2020 during one of the weirdest and hardest years uh, of, of our history. And I really think that comes down to downtown being a place for entrepreneurs. A lot of these businesses are very local. They're people trying things for the first time or they may have worked in former markets or other markets and they, they wanna be in downtown Lafayette. Uh, think the Cajun Hatter in Lilu. Mitzi worked in Los Angeles. The Cajun Hatter was in New Orleans. They decided to come downtown. I think two things are gonna be key if we want to continue to see that growth, supporting entrepreneurs in the retail sector, as well as starting to look at attracting second locations and relocations into the downtown. The DDA is standing up a retail tenant improvement program um, where folks who have a really strong business plan uh, can look for incentive opportunities specific to downtown Lafayette to open retail. So I think that's going to be super interesting to watch. And then the last thing is the infrastructure to prepare for this kind of growth that we want to see. And so the economic development district standing up, hopefully meeting very soon to establish administrative protocols so that we can start to talk to developers about what they want to do downtown and how that economic development district can help to support the infrastructure voids or shortages that we may have. Uh, and being ready for development is going to be critical as we want to see a lot of growth in the next decade, but we need to be ready for it on the public side when it comes to the infrastructure that's necessary. So I am very cautiously optimistic uh, about 2021 for downtown Lafayette. And I think that we can be a place that is an image of supporting small businesses, uh, in a place that people can be excited about Lafayette and Acadiana, and we look forward to, uh, to doing that all year long. Thanks, Anita. Chad, do you have any closing comments? Sure. Uh, I guess first to say props to Anita and uh, what she just all, you know, talked about, because it's all happening and there's an incredible momentum downtown, uh, and that's what it takes, uh, critical mass, and, and, and they go for a book for uh, the middle of the pandemic downtown and, and the custom hat maker. There's some exciting things, momentum, and all the restaurants downtown are uh, really fun to watch grow and, and, and innovate with their competitions and stuff. So uh, I think, you know, Lafayette, I think it's important to kind of reflect on what how Lafayette came about and how it developed. Uh, it, it's known as a hub city, and it was built on innovation and entrepreneurship surrounding primarily on the oil and gas. And I think the oil and gas may be shifting and, you know, a large part of it may have gone away for, for good, but uh, there's still a tremendous amount of infrastructure, personnel, knowledge, and everything that, that patents as well that come from here that are doing business around the country. And I think that's going to continue to keep us uh, in that industry, but the facilities here locally, you know, we'll have to, you know, evolve in the workforce again like i said they can build anything uh they'll start building new products 
Uh, Lafayette's a very strategic location, uh, had a significant interchange of I-10 and I-49, uh, very good access to ports, uh, systems, and, and other transportation in between some big metropolitan cities. So I think that, you know, for, for a while, Lafayette's story was we, we're an oil and gas town, then it was we need to diversify, and then the story was we are diversifying. Well, I think in a few years, we'll be able to look back and say, okay, well, we thought we were pretty dependent on oil and gas, but we're, we're still, you know, kicking along pretty well. We've kept a good momentum through all these challenges, and so what kind of city are we? And now we can really talk about our health care, which is, I'm impressed every day that just conversations I hear around town and props to, to the guys for coming together on a um, the health innovation fund, which I think is remarkable to see a city of private businesses and, and, and the hospitals come together and create that alone. So I think you'll, it's fun to see. I love to hear the CEO say we would neither, never want to live anywhere else. We, we love Lafayette, you know, the quality of life here. Uh, and, you know, I'll underline it by saying we have we have a lot of uh, real estate, vacant space, and, and a lot of affordable space here. So, uh, you know, if you're paying rent three times in another city somewhere, think about moving to Lafayette and, um, you know, cutting your expenses in half or more and, and having more fun living in Lafayette, too. So, that's Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Chad. Uh, Corey, would you like to wrap up? Sure. So um, as far as, you know, with the businesses that I work with and my outlook, or at least what I would like to continue to see in 2021 is, um, you know, small businesses um, who've, who's had to pivot through through these times, the the creative juices and the, and the innovative things that they've had to um, implement, I hope they continue doing so. Um, and, you know, not get lax as things get better when things get better so that they can continue to be innovative. Also, I, I hope more um, of our small businesses engage in more like resiliency planning. Of course, I don't know if anyone's seen uh, a pandemic coming, but you know, just resiliency planning, not just for natural disasters, which I mean, you know, us in hurricanes, we're familiar with that, but with things like pandemics and just having a plan in place, just so they're not ca caught completely off guard should something like this happen in the future. Um, I hope that people continue to capitalize on um, opportunities that this uh, pandemic brought about in, in 2021. You know, I know it, economic disturbances, it, it affects, it negatively affects so many businesses, but it seems like there's always another crop of businesses that find a way to, to benefit off of it because of the nature of the service they provide or the product that they sell. So I hope people keep on, uh, on like overturning rocks until they find something that they can capitalize on. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, with, one thing that I enjoy doing, continuing to provide resources to black owned and minority owned businesses, just to level out the, uh, the playing, uh, playing field a little bit so that those businesses can continue to thrive and for us to keep them in mind and weave them into the very fabric of what we're doing when we talk about economic development as a region. Um, and then lastly, of course, as Adam mentioned, I'm the uh, executive director of Holy Rosary Redevelopment. And as that, for those of you who are familiar with that project, um, it means a lot to that community. We're redeveloping a historic site that was once a school for um, African-American women and then later became co-ed that closed in 1993. We're redeveloping that building um, to uh, restore it back to a, a, a center for social, cultural, spiritual, educational, and economic development for that community in North Lafayette. And I'm probably most excited about the economic development piece because I'm a business guy. But um, I can tell you right now, there's so much potential there and just in what we're in talks in and, and um, what we restored into that it's going to have a strong economic development component where we're going to work with entrepreneurs. I'm excited to continue working with people in the community that puts a focus on that, Macomb Vise, uh, Neighborhood Coterie, other organizations. Uh, as well as many of the organizations represented on here who uh, also made efforts to reach uh, that population of business owners. So I'm um, looking forward to continuing to move those efforts forward. Thanks, Corey. Um, okay, Troy, uh, your closing thoughts and what you're looking forward to in 2021? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to be bold and I'm going to drop the cautious and I'm going to say I'm optimistic in 2021. Um, uh, and, and for a lot of reasons, number one, I'm a economic development chamber of commerce guy. So we were, we're always uh, somewhat optimistic. Uh, but, 
you know, the work that that uh, we have going on, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the Amazon project. Uh, kudos to Greg Gotro and Lita uh, on that project. That's a phenomenal announcement for our area. We're working on some other things with them as well that I think will be will lead to some great news for our area in, in the near future. So we're we're very excited. Our project pipeline is strong for new projects that we have. Uh, some expansion projects that we're working. Uh, we were able to certify three new sites in 2020 uh, through the uh, LED program, the Louisiana Economic Development uh, Certified Site Program. Uh, and having that inventory, uh, those arrows in our quiver to uh, work to attract new companies is uh, phenomenal for us. Um, the work that we've been doing with Corey, and I'll applaud Corey and the work that he's been doing uh, with small minority businesses across the, the area because he really does a phenomenal job. He's got a, a very much a servant's heart and uh, does does a lot of good work, and, and I'm proud to know him, proud to work with him. But the, one of the things I'll say that also gives me optimism, if you look around this, uh, the, I start to say this room, this virtual room, uh, the partners that we have in this region uh, from uh, UL to downtown to um, uh, uh, Lafayette General, Austin Lafayette General, Corey and his group. I mean, it, it just, we all work together. We all know each other. Uh, we're all comfortable with each other and we're all working with the same purpose, which is really exciting. And, and uh, we want to see great things for Acadiana as a whole. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. Y'all, this has been great. So we've got innovation, we've got investment, we've got redevelopment, um, you know, we've got a shared purpose, we've got optimism. Um, what more could you ask? I really appreciate, yes, Chad, affordable real estate as well. I really appreciate all of your time. Um, we've gone a little bit over an hour and I know you're all busy, so I don't want to I don't want to keep you any longer than we have to. But thank you all so much for sharing your time with us today. Um, I want to take a second to, again, thank our sponsors, Entergy, Acadian Ambulance and Oshner Lafayette General. And thank you to the audience that has joined us today. Um, if you're interested, we will archive this. Um, it'll be on our Facebook page the Acadian Advocate Facebook page and on our website at theadvocate.com. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.